Welcome to another exciting new episode of Talking About Stoicism, Pause for Dramatic Effect. Okay, um, last week I talked quite a bit about wealth and what, what that means to me. Um, I would like to continue this week again with letter 87. And whereas last week was kind of a long, fairly philosophical way of looking at things, um, I thought maybe this week what we would try is go back to a very central tenet in Stoicism. One that uh, I, I find myself not forgetting about, but it kind of goes to the background and it's a good thing to remind yourself of once in a while. So I think this is one of the one of the more powerful contributions of Stoicism to, to uh, uh, ancient philosophy. Okay, um, it's again letter 87, which this is the third video in that letter, but there's a lot in that letter. So, Here's what I would say. Remember last time I said Seneca actually says at this point, I see there will be no end to this topic unless I make it end. Okay, that's where we continue. So I'll stop now, at least as concerns bag and baggage. How well he foretold their present role, who first called them impedimenta. I want now to share with you just a few of the investigations conducted by our school pertaining to virtue, which in our view is sufficient for happiness. That which is good makes people good. Just as in musical skill, that which is good makes one a musician. Things depending on fortune do not make a person good. Therefore, such things are not goods. Against this, the peripatetics argue that our first premise is false. People do not automatically become good from what is good. In music, there are things that are good. For instance, a flute, a lyre, or a, an organ well suited for playing. But none of these make a person a musician. Bear with me. I'm, I'm, I'm building up to something here. Our reply to them will be this. You do not understand our premise about what is good in music. We are not referring to the things that equip the musician, but to the things that make him a musician. You are only considering the accoutrement of the skill. You don't look to the skill itself. That which is good in musicianship itself does automatically make one a musician. I would like to make the point still more clear. Good in the skill of music is said in two ways. One referring to what promotes the musician's results, the other to what promotes his skill. The instruments, flutes, and organs, and strings have to do with the results, not with the skill itself. For he is a skilled musician even without them, though he may not be able to use his skill. Where the human being is concerned, we do not find the same duality, for the good of a human being is the same as the good of a life. Okay, here we go. That which can belong to the vilest and most despicable kinds of people is not a good. But wealth can belong to the pimp and the manager of gladiators. Therefore, wealth is not a good. Your premise is false, they say, for in the teaching of literature and medicine and in navigation, we see that the relevant goods belong to the humblest kinds of people. But those skills make no claim to greatness of spirit. They do not soar to the heights, nor do they despise the things of fortune. Virtue elevates a person and places him above all that mortals hold dear. The things usually called good and bad are not for him the objects of any great desire or terror. Caledon, one of Cleopatra's eunuchs, owned a huge estate. More recently, Natalis, a man whose tongue was as filthy as it was impudent, for women were cleansed in his mouth, I'm trying not to picture it, um, was, the, was heir to many and had many heirs. What are we to say? Did money render him unclean, or did he himself defile the money? There are those whom wealth befalls in the same way as silver coins fall in the sewer. Virtue takes its stand above such things. It is assessed in its own currency. Things that can belong to just anybody do not count with it as goods. Medicine and navigation do not debar themselves, and their practitioners from the admiration of such things. Someone who is not a good man can still be a doctor, a helmsman, a teacher of literature, for heaven's sakes, even a cook. Why no love for the chefs? I don't know. When someone exhibits exceptional characteristics, you say he is an exceptional person. The person is of a kind with his characteristics. Okay, sorry for reading that long, that, that first part was maybe not entirely relevant, but here's what I was trying to say. 
For me, one of the very crucial additions of Stoicism to some of the other schools of Hellenistic philosophy, Greek, ancient Greek philosophy, is this. There are schools in ancient philosophy. Um, Aristotle was, for example, one of these people who said, okay, so certain things in life are of absolute good. For example, if you want to be happy, this is Aristotle, you have to be pretty. If you're not attractive, you can never be happy. That's quite a statement to make. Uh, likewise for health. If you're not healthy, you can never be happy. And then on, 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 on the other end of the spectrum, you, you would have a school of philosophy like the cynics, who say you don't need anything to be happy. All you need to be happy is be virtuous. If you're, if you're a good person, if you're a virtuous person, you'll be happy. Because how can you not be happy if you're a virtuous person? If you're doing all the right things, how can you not be happy? How can you not be happy? I don't know. Anyway, the Stoics, I think, added a beautiful in-between to those fairly extreme positions. Because again, Aristotle, putting it bluntly, would say, if you're ugly, you will never be happy. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how rich you become, you'll never be happy. It's impossible to be happy if you're not pretty. Now, the Stoics then say, that's not entirely true. It is correct that the most important thing in life is virtue. This is the same thing the cynics would say. Remember, Zeno, the founder of Stoicism, was initially trained by a cynic, a cynic philosopher, right? So there are definite commonalities, Venn diagram, overlap between Stoicism and Cynicism. But the Stoics continue to say, yes, but it is true that virtue is the most important thing in life, but then there are other things that are also important. And those are indifference. Indifference. Yeah, so not indifference, but indifference. And they continue to say there are preferred and dispreferred indifference, which sounds very odd because if ever there was a contradiction in terms, then preferred indifferent or dispreferred indifference sounds like one. But it's not, <clears throat> because the Stoics would say, no, 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 here's how that works. Some things are indifferent to virtue. And I think that's what Seneca is hinting at here. Take something like money. We talked the whole last video about wealth uh, and what that means. So Seneca would say, sorry, sorry, the Stoics would say something like, okay, all else being equal, you'd probably rather have money than not have money. That was as true then as it is now, I think. And, and, and there are other indifference. For example, uh, health. All else being equal, you would probably rather be healthy than not healthy. But, here's the, the crux for the Stoics, but money is a preferred indifferent. <clears throat> and health is a preferred indifferent. That means... All else being equal, you'd rather have it than not have it. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, it's indifferent to virtue. So, whether you are healthy or whether you are sick, sickness being a dispreferred indifferent, all else being e equal, you'd rather not be sick, you can still do the right thing. You can still act virtuously. And by acting virtuously, it's okay if you're sick, or it's okay if you're healthy. Likewise, money in itself is neither good nor bad. And I think he has a, a beautiful sentence here, right? There are those whom wealth befalls in the same way as silver coins fall in the sewer. Now that is as, as vivid as it can be. There are people, some of them in very high positions, who have a lot of wealth, but they abuse it terribly. And in such a case, money, it's a preferred indifferent. You would rather have it than not have it, but you can still act virtually. Virtuously. It's, it's all this online stuff, man. Okay, you can still act virtuously. But if you have a lot of money and you use it for evil, for bad purposes, you're not being virtuous. It's not the money itself, though, that is a bad thing. It depends on how you use it. It's not health itself that's a good thing. It's how you use it. You'd be 
sick and still do all the right things. You can be healthy and still do all the wrong things. You make a choice on how you choose to conduct yourself. You make a choice on how you act and whether that is in a virtuous manner or in a non-virtuous manner. Just understand that whatever you choose, there will be consequences. Consequences for your happiness. A while ago, a couple of weeks ago, I watched a series, it was on YouTube. It's a, it was a Dutch um, a sort of documentary of a guy. He, uh, he, <clears throat> he interviewed five big Dutch criminals. Like, not, not just, you know, I, I, I stole a loaf of bread once, but big criminals who had been in, like, they'd, they'd sold drugs or they were in prostitution or whatever, like, and they, many of them made a lot of money, as in millions. They made that clear, had made millions, but also did time in jail, got caught, all that stuff, and they were now out again. And I thought it was absolutely fascinating, probably because I'm, I'm a psychologist and I just, I just like to see this, this kind of dissection of human behavior. And the interviewer asked all five or six, whatever it was, criminals uh, from my Dutch friends, Echte Penose, uh, it's, it's worth watching on, on YouTube. He, he asked all these criminals, would you recommend someone to, to have a life of crime? And all of them said, no. Yes, there was a lot of money and in certain circles, prestige and, and luxury cars and, and all kinds of things. But it's not worth it, because I ended up wasting 20 years, 30 years in jail. I lost my wife, I lost my children, I lost all these kinds of things. It's not worth it. And I think that is a, a beautiful illustration of this point, right? It's not the money. In this case, it's how you obtained that money in a non-virtuous way. Not by ethical business practice, but by robbing banks, by selling drugs, by prostitution, all these kinds of things. Therein lies the rub. And again, preferred, dispreferred, indifference. And I have felt, I have found, sorry, that there are moments in my life where I struggle with something and that I think to myself, but really what i'm longing for now or what i'm what i'm what i'm what i'm after it's it's a, it's an indifferent i should be more or less indifferent to it and that's not again that that's not how how that term works it's indifferent to to virtue of these things but i should not care this much at the end of the day it's only a preferred indifferent it's only something i would all else being equal i'd rather have than not have but frankly <clears throat> It's not necessary for me to have that, whatever it is I'm, 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 I'm desiring, uh, and be virtuous. I can be perfectly virtuous without it. The most important thing is virtue. Try and do the right thing. And none of us do that all the time. It's impossible. But you can try to do it most of the time. And Stoicism says that's enough. If you make true effort to do the right thing most of the time, that's, that's all you can do. And you'll just mess up a couple of times. That's okay. So, when you struggle with something, when something is occupying your mind, ask yourself, is this maybe an indifferent? If it isn't indifferent, remember, it's an indifferent. You can live without it. It might be desirable to have it right now, but you can be a virtuous person without that thing. And I, I find that every single time it puts things in a much clearer perspective. Very important. So anyway, I hope this was useful. It's long already, so I'm going to stop here. Uh, I think that's all for letter 87. No less than three videos on it. I hope this was useful. Let me know how you see the, the, the concept of preferred and dispreferred indifference. If it, if it uh, makes sense to you, if you think it's helpful. And uh, I'll see you again soon for more talk about stoicism.